resolve to dedicate a part of your time as you ma map out your life's work to those who distress and need with no consideration of recompense. Your skills are needed, whatever they may be. Your helping hands will let someone out of the mire of distress. Your steady voice will give encouragement to others who might otherwise simply give up. Your skills can change the lives in a remarkable way of those who walk in need. If not now, when? If not you, who? It's not enough that you get a job, that you get married, that you purposely work to produce the kind of income that will make possible the luxuries of the world. You must gain some recompense. You may gain some recompense in all of this, but you will not gain the ultimate satisfaction. I believe that when we serve others, we best serve our Okay. Start off with just um, today we're doing a debt and debt reduction and a little bit of time value money. I start, thought I'd go through and just have you do a couple of problems from a time value money test. So it's on link to it. But let's let's start with just question number five. <coughs> Investment, thirty percent return, inflation twenty percent. What is your 
real return on this investment. And realize you know what they say, for every problem there's a simple answer that's wrong. What is your real return on this investment? That's the easy answer. So the easy answer is what? It's wrong, of course. It's 10%. Actually, the traditional and kind of the incorrect way of doing it is you take your nominal return minus inflation gives you the real return. That, what that would do is give you a 10% return. The correct way is, it's a linking. It's one plus your nominal return divided by one plus inflation minus one gives you your real return. And so in reality, this problem here, the answer is 8.33%. So if you, if you do use the traditional method, you're basically overstating your real return by 20%. Would you like to have 20% less of retirement? because you used the wrong calculation for it. And I, I think the answer, the answer is no. So let's just kind of take you through the process. So some people have thought that it's okay, and it's also actually called the Fisher's approximation. And the assumption is if, if these numbers are really small, then that cross term is zero. But in reality, as the numbers get a little bit bigger, the cross term is So it's really a linking formula, one plus your real return, and one plus your inflation would be one plus your normal return. When we multiply it out and simplify it, it's your real return plus inflation plus this cross term gives you your nominal return. And some people have just assumed that cross return is small. So your real return plus inflation gives you your nominal return. But, but the reality of it is it's that cross term can be significant. And so from here on out in this class, whenever we calculate real returns, we do it the correct way. So the real return is one plus your nominal return divided by 1 plus inflation minus 1. Questions? Well, this is, this is kind of the correct way. And, and that way, we won't get into these problems when, we, uh, when we're doing long-term uh, long calculations that use the real return. OK, here's another one. We've got four investments, A, B, C, and D. The return, A, is 12%, but it's compounded annually. B semi-annually, B quarterly, daily. Which of those returns would you rather have? B. Why? Three hundred sixty-five days. What? Here's the formula. Here, it's one plus the return divided by the number of periods to the number of periods minus one. So that's called your effective twelve percent compounded annually. What's your effective rate? <coughs> So it's 1 plus 12 to the 1 to the first minus 1 to 12 percent. How about the 11.9 percent return? What is that return? Yes? 12.25. How about the 11.8% compounded quarterly? Yeah, 12.33. 12.33. How about the 11.7 compounded daily? Assuming a 365 day year. So the thing we need to realize, even though D has a lower annual return due to compounding, it has a higher effective rate. So what we want to do is we want to be compared, we want to make sure we understand the effective rate. When you put your money in at a bank, are you compounded daily, monthly, quarterly, or annually? Banks generally quarterly. When you, you pay you on your when you pay interest on your credit cards, what are you compounding? So be, be aware. Okay. <laughs> okay. Today's uh, today's our topic here again. I'm losing my voice, and so uh, these are the things we're going to do. Let's talk about what's good for your financial plan. 
We're going to have, have a section on consumer loans and debt reduction. So what you need to do is, what consumer student loans do you have outstanding? What are your interest rates? What are your costs? What are your fees? What is your current debt situation? What rates are you paying? What costs and fees do you have? Your action plan. What is your debt reduction strategy? What are your views on future debts? Future debt. <laughs> I had someone write a view on future debt and just wrote debt sucks. And I'm, I, that's not quite the point, although I gave him full credit, but <laughs> there's got to be a little bit more professional in some of those, those, those comments. But, uh, and some of you, if, if you're lucky and you, you may have no debt, I know there's a number of you that, that don't have any debt, and so this, so this section will be very short. I currently have no debt. My view on future debt is, and, and we'll kind of talk about that today. Questions on what's due on this one? And this one will be due in, I think, about two weeks. Okay. Let me start with the case. You come home, you come home, it's a Sunday evening and you get a phone call from your friend and uh, ask you to help one of the children, which is uh, another professor here if you want to. And so the son came over and gave me the following information. They had four children, age 18 to three months. You can kind of see the bills. Second mortgage to pay off credit card debt. We saw the new truck. So you, you sit down with them, you know, they're, they're, this, this is a child and a friend of yours, and you put it into Teaching Tool 20, you realize that debt payments represent 83% of their live, income for living expenses. What suggestions do you have to help them with that? And you know, some of us, some of us understand, well, she lost her job because of the, 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 the last baby was unexpected. And they, they had an old car that they had leased, and the only way they had let them get out of that old car lease was to take a new car lease. So that's why the truck. In fact, when he drove up in that truck, my wife looked at that truck and said, you drive a piece of junk, that's a really nice truck. <laughs> she was talking to me. Um, how would you help them? Is this a common problem? Is this an all too common problem? Today, let's, let's kind of address some of these things. Um, let's start with the question. Why do we come with debt? Why don't we take a couple minutes? And one of the downsides of being a professor is you're, you're always trying to figure out what are the reasons. Think, think through the reasons. Why do we go with debt? Why don't we take a couple of minutes?
So my question is like, when you buy a car, you can, you know, bring all the cash in and buy the car. Sometimes you really need if, if you can, you know, and like I said, for that first car too. The point is, is it, there's a question: if you pay for cash for a car, would you pay more or less than if you get a loan? And I, I'm amazed that people will pay fifteen to twenty thousand more on a car because of it's a debt rather than if you pay cash. For it. So, so. The research has shown that people do not consider, you know, cat, you know, debt and non-cash things. That we don't consider it the same as cash, and we'll pay a lot more. Um, can't you get like a better rate though? Eventually? Like, so let's say you build your credit score for like paying off a car, and let's say you pay five thousand more. In the long run, though, like if you're about to purchase a house in like five, ten years, and then if your credit score is better, can't you get a better rate on your mortgage? We will. We'll talk about those okay. things. And there's actually strategies when, when you're buying houses and cars together. Um, here's a. Here's a, another thought. Um, are there common themes as to why we go in Christ? Now you read that the spiritual roots of human relations. Is there, is there are there some roots or are the things why we go into death? Well, um, let me just share one one slide. Can I get you to read that for me, please? The time has come to get our houses in order. So many of our people are living on the very edge of their income. In fact, some are living on borrowing. The economy is a fragile thing. There is a portion of stormy weather ahead to which we have better get to. I'm troubled by the huge consumer installment debt which hangs over the people of the nation, including our own people. I recognize that it may be necessary to borrow a home, of course. So let us buy a home that we can afford. We are carrying a message of self-reliance throughout the church. Self-reliance cannot be obtained when there is serious debt hanging over a household. One has neither independence nor freedom from bondage when he is obligated to others. I urge you to look to the condition of your finances. I urge you to be modest in your expenditures. Discipline yourselves in your purchases to avoid debt to the extent possible. Pay off debt as quickly as you can and free yourselves from bondage. This is a part of the temporal gospel in which we believe. If you have paid your debts, if you have a reserve, even though it may be small, 
Men should storms howl about our heads. You will have shelter and peace in your hearts. That's all I have to say about it. But I wish to say it with all the emphasis of which I am capable. You guys can't see the date on this, but that was 1998. Three years before it came out. I, I home taught, taught a family. <laughs> and when the prophet came out and said this, his family said, you know, we really need to do this. And so they cut back on their expenses. They <coughs> sold their house. They downsized. And, and because of that, that, when the Twin Towers went down, and we had that, that third recession then, his business was with international consulting, dropped by 60%. The next year, it dropped by another 50%. But because he had followed the council, he was able to survive and write down his mission press. Um, he and his wife were mission press. So the point here is we, we have to. And so the question is, what are the. What are the themes or reasons? And let me just share a few ideas. And, and I think that we just, just, just some thoughts. We start with going a little bit. That instead of living, we, living according to our income, we, we kind of take on a little bit more of that to keep up our lifestyle. We don't want to change that lifestyle. And pretty soon we'll continue taking on more debt and more credit cards. And pretty soon we can't get an additional debt. And finally we suffer the consequences of debt. And the downside is when do we start getting help? When do we start wanting help? Is when we're right here. When should we really be concerned? Is at the very top. Um, I think as I've kind of gone through it, I think there's really five reasons we go into debt. Ignorance. We don't understand it. It's a bad interest in the top. Two, carelessness. Compulsiveness, pride, and necessity. What's interesting is I've been through my career, the necessity ones I can probably count on one hand. On one hand. Maybe two. The people that I've worked with. Um, so what do you do? I believe that ignorance has to give way to wisdom. What's wisdom? The ignorant learn wisdom by humbling himself and calling upon the Lord that is high in the And wisdom in my youth, you learn in my youth to keep the commandments. I think my dad was one of the smartest people around. And, and he was. But I think my dad was good because he learned that the importance of his obeying command. The Lord gave us these commandments. They're not restrictive, they're protective. And that's the way my dad protected his children, by helping them understand. I believe that carelessness gives way to exactness. Once we understand the things we need to do, we need to be exact. We need to be exact in budgets, exact in our goals, and exact in following through. I like what Clayton Christensen talked about um, obeying the, the Sabbath day. He talked about it being in the equivalent of the NCAA tournament, and they played on Sunday. He said probably the most important decision he made was not to play on that one Sunday. He says it's easier to be true 100% of the time than it is to be true 99.5%. Compulsiveness gives way to dil diligence. We live on a budget. We spend, uh, we spend only on the things that are important to us. like this, what the Lord said to the prophet, inasmuch as you're diligent, humble, and exercise the prayer of faith, behold, I will soften the hearts of those to whom you're in debt, till I shall send means for your deliverance. It's interesting, we go into debt ourselves, but the Lord will help us if, if we do it his way. And then pride gives way to humility. And in the final, necessity gives way to self-reliance. Like the scripture in either 12.27, Men come unto me, I'll show them their weakness. The reason, a lot of people think that, oh, I've got these problems, I've got these concerns, I must be a bad person. You realize that's not the case. The Lord gives us weaknesses, so why? So we'll be humble and teachable. And if we humble ourselves and be and before Him, He'll make weak things become strong. I like what Ezra Tap Benson says. <laughs> the Lord works from the inside out. The world works from the outside in. The world will take people out of the slums. Christ takes the slums out of the people. And then they take themselves out of the slums. The world would mold men by changing their environment. Christ changes men, who then change their environment. The world will shape human behavior, but Christ can change human behavior. Through these things, we can change 
Is there, a, is there a good way to get out of this? What's the best way to stay out of debt? When I was a kid growing up, uh, I had a brother who was wounded in Vietnam. While I was in Vietnam, they gave him these models. And he had a 65 Corvair. <coughs> While he was in the hospital in Vietnam, he chopped that 60, 1965 Corvair model in half and he shoved it back together and he never stood it again. So when he came back after the war, he actually chopped 32 inches out of the middle of a 1965 Corvair and shoved it back. And then it was really kind of a cool car. It had a Corvair back end that looked like a Corvette top and uh, it looked like an El Camino front end. And then he sold it to my other brother who blew the, Cor the Corvair engine in back and so he put a Corvette LT1 engine in front. So if you could imagine a car that had about 480 horsepower weighing at about 2,600 pounds. It was a it was a pretty fun thing. And so you can tell my, my, my brother was pretty, it was, it was, it was good at what he did. And so he, what he used to do is he used to like to race it. And so on weekends he'd go down and places they would race it. And needless to say, he, he had somewhat of a lead foot. And he was waxing philosophical one day. And he says, Brian, if you never get your first ticket, you'll never get your second. And that's kind of the advice we give us. If we never go into debt the first time, other than the things that our leaders have said, we'll never go into debt the second time. And so, the best way to stay out of debt is really not to go into it in the first place. And that's why I had Gov and his kids come in and do, the, uh, do that, that little play. It seems really simple. It's in the book. It's only one page. The advice is priceless and the cost is free. Um, let me share a note. From, uh, this is from the LDS website. And it kind of explains the challenge that people are in. It says, I didn't make it past the fortunately we have the counsel of the prophets of God to guide us. Because I know the counsel. I'm still in debt and I don't know how to get out. I wish the church would offer concrete advice to those who are foolish enough to already be in debt instead of heaping more guilt upon our heads. I'm avoiding new debt, but paying off the old is a grinding load. Yes, we pay our tithing, we always have. The temptation to use that tithing money to pay down debt is just that, a temptation. And we pay it no heed. But it is discouraging and disheartening and a guilt-ridden situation. How do you repent while you still owe tens of thousands? I know I'm just rambling here. But I wish the site were set up. If you're in debt, here's the help button instead of lessons on how to avoid it. It's too late for you. I was on a, I was on a TV program with this lady, uh, five kids, divorced, and uh, talked about it. It's a BYU essential program. And it was interesting just to see her, the, the, the joy that came across her face when she told her when she paid off her last step. So five kids, she went back to school, got a good job. Uh, and she said, you know, you just can't imagine the feeling of relief that brings when you paid off your last step. And the question is, for, for some people, that, again, the society encourages that. Um, let me just, just share a, a video. From Landing Tree. Hopefully it'll work. I'm Stanley Johnson. I've got a great family. I've got a four-bedroom house and a great community. Like my car? It's new. I even belong to the local golf club. How do I do it? I'm in debt up to my eyeballs. <laughs> I can barely pay my finance charges. 
smart way to handle your debt? At LendingTree.com, you can lower your monthly payments by using the equity in your home with either a home equity loan or by refinancing your mortgage. Call 1-800-555-TREE now. Somebody help me. <laughs> Come to LendingTree.com, where you can... <laughs> It's interesting when my wife and I moved back here. We moved from California to Provo. Um, we were driving through some of these neighborhoods, and my wife and I didn't realize there was so much of room. And the realtor said, if not, then people are basically the same thing. People are very messy. And the downside is, you know, we always expect the future to be just like the past. And when things change, <coughs> We, we, we get the results of that. Um, is there a process to help us get out of debt? And let me just kind of share uh, share some thoughts. And the reason why are we teaching you? Most people here don't have debt, or the only debt you have is student, student debt. Why am I spending time with each of you here talking about going out of debt, getting out of debt? Yes. That way we know how to stay out of debt. How to stay out of debt. Well, especially share it with others. Too. Especially share it with others. Again, the purpose you're in this class here is not just because so you'll get a grade or do your own financial plan. It's so you guys are going to go and you will be the you will be the ward and the state uh, financial specialist wherever you go in the world. And we, we need you to be able to do it. So just some thoughts. Number one, accept that you have a problem. Start. Stop incurring debt. Someone said if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. Make a list of all your bills. One shot ways of reducing debt. Organize a debt repayment or debt elimination plan and follow. Mm -hmm. Some will kind of take you. So what's a what's a debt reduction? What are debt reduction strategies? Basically, ways you can get out of debt. And there's a lot. There's a, a number of different ones you could use. Different types of strategies. Really personal strategies. There are counseling strategies, and then there's legal strategies. But we'll talk about each of those there. Um, first of all, personal strategies. Kind of one of the main ones is uh, setting up just kind of a a debt, debt elimination spreadsheet. You flip all of your, your, de your debts. You start by highest interest rate. Why would you pay off your highest interest rate first? <coughs> and most expensive. And if your columns or creditors start away, that way you, you pay off all of the debts, the highest debt first. And so once you pay off the first debt, you take the money that you would have spent, but you've already paid it off, and then you use that to pay off the second debt. And so the assumption here is you keep paying the same amount until all debts are paid off. And this is the one I recommend from, from uh, Marvin J. Ashton's one for the money. So notice that $110, so we make minimum payments on all of them, and, but we put all the extra to that first one. So that 110, now we go to 170, that pays off that 180, then we add that 50, 230, add that 75, 305. And then what I tell people after that, you keep paying that same amount, but you pay that same amount into yourself to continue to, to keep paying it off. And then you can use what Dave Ramsey calls the debt, uh, debt snowball. And you can basically do the same thing, only he says pay off the smallest one first, so you're excited about paying off one debt, and then continue to, continue to do that. Um, and truthfully, what I've found is it really doesn't matter which of those you use, because it's usually within a month or two of the payoff date. Um, this is Teaching Tool 20. This is the tool that I used with that couple that we, um, that uh, from the first case study. But this is how I found that their take-home pay was was 83% um, of their wages available for living expenses. So the nice thing about here is we can actually clear this form. We can add new debt. Okay, piano. $5,000, <coughs> APR 15%, months to pay off 60 months. So now we can go up and we can add more. And so with this couple, I actually had 27 columns. Oh. It was not a fun experience. But the nice thing about this, we can continue on it. I just put into some sample debt data here. And now, okay, what's our, what's our beginning month? We are starting in 
The table will start in February, we're 2013. So we've got, you can see we have Two hundred four thousand. So we're going to calculate. So notice, with this stuff here, we're beginning month is February two thousand and thirteen. Our ending month is October twenty twenty eight. Now, just out of curiosity, what happens instead if we pay the highest interest first? So Gov Allen, who was here before, he's the one who set me up with this. Let's do the shortest shortest payout first. So October twenty twenty eight. Calculate November 2028. So what's the difference of whether we do the short of the payoff? One month. <laughs> but then we can come up. So now, if we follow this strategy, we'll pay this. We'll pay it 12 years off early. And notice how much interest we'll pay. We'll pay 124000 in interest. What happens, though, if we can make an extra payment? Let's say, okay, we get our income tax back here of $3,000. And then we get another $3,000 here. Now we can say, okay, we've just, January 2000, we've just cut it by six months. And realize we have $204,000 in debt. The other thing we can do too, what happens? What happens if we add an accelerator? What's an accelerator? Yes? Some extra cash that you put Let's in. Say we, say we add an accelerator, we can pay off an extra $100 per month, per month on our debts. And we can do calculate. So we just cut it by a year and a half, almost two years. But the point of view is this this is a tool that's, that's a useful tool. We wrote it in BBA um, to help you out. Um, but I think it's a good tool. Type. The year's paid early. What is it? So it's 13. 13.6, 13. so almost 14 years early. Earlier, if you had done what? If you had just paid everything so you paid your th regular 30 year loan. So if you if you just paid everything exactly to their, their time period. And then you can also look at that total interest saved, 115000 dollars So the point here is you can do this. Yes? No, I was just curious, does that accelerate the idea that it's paying off principal? Yes. Okay. Yes. I have a, a, a brother who Needless to say, was um, not very good at keeping records. So he had his business, and the IRS came in and said, "You know what? He basically, just call this cash out of his business for the, the debts that he should have paid." But he, he later decided, you know, he figured out what he had been doing wrong, and he went through it. And he decided he was going to use this type of method. He had a, a, a business, tobacco business, and he came through and he said, "I figured it out. If we follow this method." Which is paying off your most we can pay we can pay off business in seven years. And that includes, includes the house. Five years later he was on sale. He was really close to having a lot paid off. Can you imagine having your business, not only your house paid off, but your business debt all paid off as well? What kind of luxury does that mean? And the things that, that, that you're doing. Um, and so that's what again, these are personal strategies. Um, What about? Question. Oh yes. So is that like on Learning Suite to download or? Yeah, it's on your CD as well. All of the tools that we have, uh, they're on the website. They're on, on Learning Suite as well. And so and realize, since it's the, our stuff here for the class, you guys can make not the quicken CD, but the other one you can make as many copies of that tool. And you know, the, the truth is, is we're well, um, we'll probably we'll be changing them every year. We, we updated and things like that, so hopefully it'll be on the website. So what do you got? Add, consolidate your debts with a simple home equity loan. Reduce the interest, and your interest may be tax deductible. Good idea, bad idea. 
And this is the problem with that one couple, the first case study. They, you know, after three years, they took out a home equity loan to pay off their debts. What's the downside of having equity in your home? People started using their houses as ATMs. And now, where they used to have a whole bunch of equity for retirement, and now they have no equity at all. So what do you think? Good idea, bad idea? It depends. Like, you know. And here's the answer here. It's a loan against the equity in your home. It depends. Have you addressed the original problem, that, original spending problem that got you into debt in the first place? your job stable enough that you could take on additional long-term debt. And the problem is, is people use those home equity loans so they didn't have to change their behavior. They didn't have to change their spending. And so they continued spending as if they were. And so, reduces your monthly payment. You'll pay more. You know, even though you'll pay more in interest, which will you pay more interest on? If you take this interest and you spread, you'll pay a lower interest rate, but you'll spread it out over 30 years. Pay up, you'll pay a lot more. And here's the, the statistic that's interesting. 80% of those who take out a home equity loan to pay off credit card debts are back where they were in debt within three years. The habit hasn't changed, the spending continues, and they're back in debt. And that's what happened to this couple. So they took out a home equity loan to pay off their debt, and then within three years they were actually more in debt than they were before because they, they hadn't changed their spending habits. So let's talk about some other ones. Um, so there are things, credit counseling agencies, any of you have seen these on TV, you know, help us, we'll get you out of debt. There's a couple of them that are two. Uh, there's two types. There are nonprofit and for-profit credit agencies. Now, the for-profits are debt consolidation, debt negotiation. And these can be very dangerous. So be, be careful. Even the, the nonprofit ones here. Basically, nonprofit, uh, their goal is to help people reduce their credit card debt. And how, what do they cost? 15, 20 for the set, set up, roughly $12 a month. And what they do is they have arrangements with the credit card companies that they get a rebate back of everything you pay to the credit card companies. So who basically do they work for? Credit card companies. But, but they, they can be helpful. National Foundation for Credit Counseling reimbursed 10%. Um, people are concerned, well, will this impact my credit report? If you're in debt, do you really need more credit? The answer is no. So sometimes um, some of the Utah programs, it'll be noted on the credit report. Generally, the assumption here is generally some companies would rather have some of their um, money back than none at all. And here's a question to ask. What's your tax ID or your license? members of the National Credit Foundation. How long will I be in your program? And it should never be longer than roughly about five years. And generally what they do is they take their money from your credit, uh, from your checking account and they use it. There's another group that's called for-profit credit counseling companies. And they make money helping you get out of debt. And so they do a couple of ways. Number one, they'll consolidate your debt into a single loan. Often it's an interest-only loan, so you'll be paying less on you'll be paying less on principal, nothing on principal, and then you can use that to pay down your debts. What's the risk in that type of a loan? What's the risk of an interest-only loan? Is it like a credit card? You just keep making a minimum payment for the rest of your life. Pardon me. That's what it sounds like. It sounds like. But if you have it, go ahead, Tyler. Yeah, you can play interest for so many years, and then you, that ends, and then you have all the principal, so you have to pay the principal back faster than Principal you back. Pay. Let's say you have a 10-year interest-only loan. You pay interest for the first 10 years only, but now you have to pay a 30-year loan back in 20 years, and so that interest payments, the principal payments are substantial. Or what they can do is they can work with creditors. To, to reduce the interest rate or basically reduce the principal. And what they'll do is you'll continue to pay to them, but they'll stop paying pay, pay, pay payments to the credit card company. And then after six months, they'll go to the credit card company and say, you know what, um, they're not going to be able to make any payments. Is there any way we can negotiate? Maybe 50 cents on the dollar or 80 cents on the dollar. Now, the problem is, is there's no guarantee that the credit card company will, will allow it. 
So you've been making the payments, but they stopped the payments. So there's the risk that they say no. So your credit, you know, your credit shot even even more. There's no guarantee. So here's the question for that: How much will it cost? How do you get paid? How do they make their money? How long will I be here in the firm? So you need to be very careful when you do these type of things. Um, here's some warning signs: high upfront fees, promises they cannot deliver. Uh, we promise creditors will cut the principal owed by set 50 percent. Pre pressure to sign up debt reduction service at the moment you call. I get up early in the morning and sometimes when it's cold, we, we have a little exercise room in our room and there's a TV there. I'm amazed. In the past, the number of these credit card, these type of companies has been, it's been huge. You know, you can see three or four in the morning. <coughs> so, what we need to be, need to be wise. And then we get legal strategies. <coughs> Bankruptcy. So, you know, is bankruptcy a big deal? Um, it used to be bankruptcy was a, a bigger deal than I think it is now. Um, my dad, when, um, when I was growing up, he built chapels for the church. So he, when he got back from World War II, he was in Fresno, and then he started. And what the church would do is they would hire a general contractor. This general contractor would go to a town, and then this, the members would supply the labor, and the church would supply the materials. And then with the, uh, the member's labor and the, and the instruction from the general contractor, they would build the chapel. And so my dad built the Orangeburg Chapel in Modesto, and then the Brookside Chapel in Stockton, and then he built the chapel in Brentwood. And then he and a friend decided to go into business for themselves. So they borrowed money from the bank, and they started building houses. And needless to say, the economy turned south. And they could not, could not sell the houses. And so people said, well, let's go bankrupt. My dad said, no. We went to every one of his creditors and he said, you know what, this is the problem we have right now. And he said, I, you will get paid if you, if you just need to bear with me. And so he basically bought his truck and his tools and everything about back in the bank. And within the next two to three years, he was able to pay everyone. And he learned a lot of important lessons, like being, he was the one that, uh, he, he was one responsible for the finances after that. But that was an interesting lesson to us kids. And then fast forward, you know, 30 years to my brother who didn't quite make his IRS payments. <laughs> you know, it, 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 people said to him, get just do my bankruptcy. He said, that's okay. He said, no, I won't. He learned the lesson from my dad. And he went back to every one of his creditors and he said, you know, I messed up. It was my mistake. But if you'll bear with me, I will pay you the interest. And in the next two to three years, he had paid everything. So often, sometimes, that are things that are legal may not be the best way. Um, chapter 7, liquidates assets using to pay creditors, quickest, sim simplest kind. Certain debts can't be waived, including child support, student loans. And chapter 13 is really, uh, actually in the 13, what we're trying to do, binds the debtor and creditors in terms of repayment. And so to think about with bankruptcy, um, Interesting, 87% of bankruptcy are due to the three factors. Number one, divorce, death, or separation. Number two, unpaid medical expenses, <coughs> loss of primary sources of employment. So if we can, number one, if we can make sure we have adequate life insurance, make sure we're going on date, dates every weekend, we're keeping the romance alive in our way. Make sure we have adequate health insurance. So that's why I say in this class that a date every weekend is a fixed expense and not a variable expense. <laughs> <laughs> or loss of primary source of employment. Realize that the only insurance you have are your abilities and are you continuing to work on those abilities. So if we can eliminate the likelihood of these events, we can, we can eliminate substantially the risk of bankruptcy. But I like about it. You know, bankruptcy, is it on this? Is it just a way to get out of debt with it? And the things that are legal may not always be honest. Is it really necessary? And realize it will be on your credit reports for up to 10 years. And it will have the chance of getting uh, the purchase of a over 50. I like what Elder Porter says. And I'm just going to read the last little bit. He says, there is a question that asks of those who seek a temple recommend that deals with honesty. I hope, sincerely hope that those who have taken unfair advantage of this just and proper law don't carry a temple recommend that deal with their own. 
interesting article in the newspaper it saw, says is tithing or is it tithing or carelessness that leads Utahns to bankruptcy? And I think really it's carelessness in many cases. I'm not saying in all cases. But, but, but we need to be wise in the things that we do. So let's go back to our case study. After the things that we talked about, what would you do? What would you do? Let's spend a couple of minutes and start talking about the things that... What would you do to help them? Or these people? And for their friends? sure the situation, but are they, like, if they weren't upside down in their house, um, you're talking about how it might be, there are a lot of implicit costs to owning a house, like property taxes and all the extra utilities and things to upkeep all that, and yeah. you wouldn't pay if you rent. So if they have no equity in the home anyway, they lose nothing. Yeah, they have a little bit, a little bit of equity in their home. Oh, that's even better then. So let's say yeah, they, they sell their house, and then they start renting immediately, yeah. and lower the, and they can rent a smaller place and then immediately save all those implicit costs and then immediately pay off their home equity and their mortgage and then they could use all that extra money to start paying them everything. Well they did it, they started too late to buy the second home equity loan and they, they couldn't get the second 
Okay. They could not get this. They tried for a second home equity loan to pay off their credit cards at the end, and they couldn't get it this time because the, their credit was too bad. Uh, and, yes? We feel like they should start by probably selling the truck and getting a cheaper car. Like anybody, if you're in a tough financial situation, you can easily get a used car for like five thousand dollars and eighteen thousand dollars. Now the truck, though, the truck is a lease truck, and so what happens is, and they got the, the lease one because they leased another car for five years, and the car was falling apart, and the only way they would let them get out of the previous lease was to take on a new lease. But the truck was in immaculate shape. He kept, I must admit, he kept it in very good shape. Think about to the, the long term. How do we really help people? To do. We need to change our lifestyle. Looking at the Christmas bills, they have three thousand dollars bills, and they're struggling. Maybe next year, if they don't have the money, we should have spent three thousand dollars on Christmas. How do we teach? First of all, think about how I taught you. people in such a way that you don't tell them any answers and they all take hope and every answer on their own. But you keep them the kind of that they can keep. talked about what was important to them, their goals. And what, they weren't my goals. They were their goals. And then they talked about what they wanted to do with their kids. They talked about what they wanted to do with their families. They talked about those things. You know, we didn't spend a lot of time together in the area, but we emphasized it. Make sure that they're working toward their goals and not their goals. What do you think you do next? So we talked about perspective. We talked about goals. What do we talk about next? What, what have we done in this class? Budgeting. So we figured out where they were financially. So we went through, we developed a balance sheet. Figured out how much was owed on each asset, the truck. We had a motorcycle. How much would it cost to fix the motorcycle up so we could sell it? We developed an income statement, financial races for the family, which were not very good. So how much was available and where it was going? We put the family on a very strict budget. We stuck them on a, a little bit for a date on Friday night. You can still, you know, 
My wife and I will go we'll split a meal at a restaurant and then we'll go to the dollar. Room. But that's a fixed expense. But we left them some of that. Um, so the next thing, what do we do next? We talked about why we went into debt in the first place. Because the goal is to change behavior. People go into debt. So we talked about the different challenges. And I remember this couple, he was in tears. And he said, Brian, why don't they teach us this when we're young? Why do I have to wait until I'm older? And so spiritual reasons, the need to get their house in order, the need, need to put Heavenly Father first. I believe that the most important thing as we help people is, is if the purpose of personal finance is to bring us to Christ, and to help us to fulfill our missions on earth, then everything we should do should teach them. Help them to see the vision of who they are. And once they see the vision of who they are, then they will come to understand the action. So what, what did I get them doing? I got them to have any family will meet me. I'm not the family forever. Not of attending church. Coming back and getting that fellowship there. We started about six weeks later. Uh, after we started, I walked into Zupas and went did my thing. And then one of the lady, lady who was on the other side, she goes, What are you doing to my parents? And she pointed her finger right at me. And I have never <laughs> seen this person before. <laughs> <laughs> I go, uh, No idea who you are. <laughs> she goes, I, I'm, I'm this couple's daughter. She said, "Whatever you're doing, keep it up." So we had family meeting every night, very you know, every week for the last thing, and I think we're doing good. Um, but it was interesting. But why? Why they went into debt in the first place? And they realized they had to change things. And they had to change. They had to make those structural changes. And then, what off ways of reducing debt? We had them fill out their income taxes, but really they got a refund. We had them fill out their income taxes early. So instead of waiting until April to get that money back, this was January. We got it, we got it at the end of January. We borrowed money. They had a cash value insurance policy that was taking a lot of money. And we actually figured we had to borrow against that as much as anything that they would not get from bankruptcy. So we spent, I hate to say, we spent three hours with a bankruptcy attorney. Um, and I went there with him and just sat through them, uh, and then decided against going bankruptcy. They had to sell assets they could do without the truck. Um, you know, I, I told him, I said, would you like me to go in with you? He says, no, I'll go in. So we cleaned his truck up, we went back to the dealership. And you know the scripture that says that, that I will soften the hearts of those that you're in debt? He went back to him and he said, you just kind of laid out the situation. Here's what's happening. Here's the situation. And uh, the manager at the dealership went back and said, well, let me go see the truck. And this guy kept an immaculate vehicle. And he came back to him and he said, okay, so if you, you come current on your lease payments, which is three more payments, and we'll take the truck out. You know, the, the scripture that talks about, you know, you do the things you should not soften the hearts. And as, as he was leaving, another, another salesman came up to me and he says, I hope you know how rare this is. He says, you're the only second person in, what, in the last 12 months that we've taken a vehicle. Um, so assets, all vehicles, etc. And then we determined a course of action, a plan. Probably the most important thing was they came in Tuesday nights at 9 o'clock. They came and hung out with me and we talked. And most of the time it was just helping them to see that this, this is really what they wanted. The goals were important. They were moving in the right direction. <coughs> and so committed to that, that, that course of action. We used Teaching to a point, worked on that plan together. We got other people involved, other people in the ward that kind of helped them out. Work together, talking to creditors, paying off debts. I was amazed. I started talking with some of the creditors to help out. And I was amazed some of the creditors would rather allow them to go into bankruptcy than spend time. Yeah, and it just seems so weird and counterintuitive. But we worked together. We held them accountable for it. And, and I met with them weekly so they could stick with the plan. Now it's actually five years there, but they're still in debt. But you know what? They're getting closer. They're pretty much to that. They're, pretty, they're, they're on a path that they can handle. Was it easy? No. Was it painful for them? Yes. Her comment this, says, I just didn't realize that it would be so hard for so long. 
you run into debt, but you crawl out of it. Are they, are they doing better with their and the answer is yes. So, kind of in summary, you know, it's, it's interesting. People wouldn't think of not paying their tithe. Say, say you can get people to go into debt, pretty soon you owe so much on your minimum payment that you can't pay. And, and so the key is, is we need to understand why we're going into debt, why we're doing it. The, the time to, to make the decisions on you know, how much debt you're going to use is not when you're up there at the car dealership trying to decide. It's before you even go. Time to make decisions on what you're going to go into debt for is right now. You know, and realize, realize the purpose of this. When you're helping people, I find the first thing I need to do is get them back on the purpose of personal finance is bringing us to Christ. Let's just get people on the way for get them reading the scriptures and saying the prayers. Get them continuing that communication with heaven. And then often all it takes is a friend just to help them and encourage them to guys you're on the right path. I have a, 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 a niece, and two days a week I sit and talk with them and my whole discussion is just they're working on these things. It's really just that help them. Because they are on the right path. They do know the things they need to do. And just, just be, a, be a support that, that you know, they can do it. Um, but if we can help people do the things they should first, then the Lord will. But there, there's a real problem out there, and we need good people who can, um, who can solve it. The good news is you guys are in the place. Questions? Thanks, everyone. Well, one more thing. Um, we'll have a uh, help section tomorrow for the quiz. The quiz will be due before class on Tuesday. I encourage you to come to the help section. So that those can be helpful. When you take the quiz, there is a formula sheet that allows you to do that. Yes? What time is the help section tomorrow? Um, uh, Aaron will actually uh, send you an email on that time. Okay. Thanks, everyone.